So before we begin, let me stress that in everything that I've done, whether it is my walking tours, and speaking of my walking tours, let me just tell you that the dates have been set, and now I'm just trying to fill in the blanks. And I should have those hopefully within the next few weeks. It's always a challenge to try to find a new mix, to try to create some new tours. Uh, and so that's, what, that's the point I'm at right now. But I should have those dates, those locations and dates firmed up by when we meet again here at the library. Uh, but if you have any questions, if you have any comments you'd like to make about what we're going to be talking about this evening, please feel free to raise your hand or ask questions. Uh, we have between now and 8.30 when the voice comes on the intercom that it's getting time for us to leave the library. So we'll have ample opportunity to cover whatever questions or comments that you might want to have. So I want to encourage that. And I always like to give across the impression, that I always want people to know that I do not know everything. But I always like to say when I did my tours, don't tell my daughters that. Um, so you know, if, if there are things that you would like to add to, please do. Um, the way that I was able to um, look, just sort of divide this up and figure out how we could um, aim it in some realistic sections, because this is not something, when Beth gave me this opportunity to do this, she wasn't going to give me 15 weeks like I had in a semester. So we sort of cut it up a little bit. So this is Michigan, my Michigan, part two. But let's go and look at, and I always have to reacquaint myself with this. OK. It's on. I thought it was on. OK. I'm wondering if I'm touching the right thing. Well, when all else fails, go to the computer. OK. So I divided these into sessions. And each session has three parts. So the first session that we did about a year ago, the three parts, we looked at the first peoples, the natives that were here in Michigan, and we carried that up to the birth of the Republican Party. So that was the first session. The second session, which we started in the fall here at the library, we looked at the Civil War. Um, we looked at uh, the last time we met, which was in November, so very long ago. We looked at the economy during the 19th century, and we covered what I refer to as the four-legged stool of the economy in Michigan at this time period. And we covered lumbering, mining, agriculture, and manufacturing. Those last three topics are what we're going to be looking at today. So we're finishing up the last half of the 19th century into the beginning of the 20th century with Michigan history. Then on Thursday, May 9th, we're going to be meeting again. And we're going to be starting the third session of Michigan, my Michigan. And we're going to be looking at uh, the 20th century in Michigan. And we're going to be looking at, initially, primarily the automobile industry. Because when you're looking at the history of Michigan, especially Michigan in the 20th century, it's the automobile industry that really, if you'll excuse me using this, has, really has driven the economy in Michigan. I know, I thought you'd like that. Um, for a long time, and even to this day. So that's what we will do in May. And then we'll take a little hiatus during the summer, and then we'll come back in the fall and finish up that session. Um, my next plan would be a fourth session. That's going to be a little bit shorter, because when you get past World War II, I don't think that that would be three sessions. So that's what we're talking about um, tonight. So we'll look at urbanization, immigration, and progressivism. OK, so let's look at urbanization. Because we really haven't talked too much about what was going on in the, in, we've looked at the economy, we looked at impact of national, um, okay, uh, national events like the Civil War. But let's look a little bit about what was going on in life in Michigan at this time period, urbanization. Well, one of the ways that you can tell how Michigan was changing is when you look at population of cities. And the one city I aim on is, of course, the largest city of Michigan, and that's Detroit. So you can see the difference in population in just a 20-year time period. It is going up close to 130,000 people just in the city of Detroit. Well, what are the specific reasons that we are looking at? Well, it sort of reflects what we talked about in that uh, session we had uh, last year, the impact of manufacturing how that was growing by leaps and bounds, especially in large cities like Detroit, like Lansing, like Grand Rapids, like Kalamazoo, 
where, where cities were producing, companies were producing products that they needed for the market. And so you look at the growth of, for example, the cigar industry in Detroit, the furniture industry in Grand Rapids. That's going to have an impact on the population. Industries are declining, lumbering and mining. Now, I'm not saying that it didn't, that it's, it still continued, especially in the last half of the 19th century. But because of technology, you don't need as many people doing these things as what you did before. So what are those people going to have to do? They're going to have to find other jobs. And where are those jobs going to be? In the cities. Same thing happened with agriculture. We were still in the 19th century predominantly an agricultural state, even though manufacturing was uh, getting up there as far as employment goes. But the same thing happened with agriculture, where because of the tools and the instruments that were out there, and we, we, uh, when you look at Michigan history, many of those were made in Michigan, you're not going to need, again, as many people on the farms as what you needed before. So those people have to go elsewhere. And then you have migration. Now, I threw in chain migration. Um, one of the books that I talked about was Brian Wilson's book called Yankees in Michigan. And that's part of the um, ethnic series that Michigan State has published. And he does a wonderful job talking about the types of migration that came to Michigan. And one of the terms he uses is chain migration, where you come, and then a relative comes, and then you bring more people that come. And that's something that's going on now, too, throughout the 19th century. So what are the challenges now in these cities, no matter how big or small that they are? Well, one of the challenges is providing you know, the, the growth, you know, delivering and improving services, basic services, like, for example, sanitation. Now, I, I have to uh, note that the photographs that you're going to be seeing this evening, a lot of them come from Kalamazoo. I wonder why. But they really do serve as a good illustration of what was going on. These two photographs come from stereographs, and they're Vine Street. Now, exactly in which direction that they're pointing, I don't know. But what these gentlemen are doing is they're laying uh, sanitation, sanitary sewers down there. And that's one thing we think of. Well, sanitation. Kalamazoo started laying down sanitary sewers in 1867 just two years after the end of the Civil War. Saginaw it took them between 1866 and 1889 for a cost of about $500,000. Now keep in mind, that's $500,000 in the 19th century. So improving a level of sanitation, that's one way that you're improving your cities, because your cities are growing. What is another way? Well, improving your water supply. Um, this is a stereograph of a Holly water system and again, Kalamazoo. Now, I will tell you, this is not just going to be all Kalamazoo, but one likes to crow about one's community, let's be honest. Um, in 1869, Kalamazoo built the first municipal-owned water purification system. It was called the Holly Water System. And this is an early photograph of it. Where it was located uh, should be no surprise for, the, for those of you from Kalamazoo that knows what happens when it floods and where it floods. It's around Crosstown Parkway. So Crosstown Parkway and South Burdick Street is where the Holly Water Works were located for many years. Um, there is now a building there that used to be an American National Bank building. Um, and that's where the water system was located until it came down and uh, that building was built. So water systems. Um, let's talk about fire and police. That's another thing they're doing at this time period, post-Civil War, to try to improve life in, in, in Michigan cities. So previous to uh, probably before the Civil War, maybe even a little bit after the Civil War, excuse me for slurping, um, you had something like this, which a volunteer fire company. You might have a village or a city that might have a series of volunteer fire companies. This was the Germania Fire Company in uh, Kalamazoo. And, uh, but as the Civil War ends and these cities are growing bigger, there's this need to professionalize the fire department. So you begin to see paid fire companies. And uh, Detroit, now actually, when Detroit first became a village, it was going to be more of your responsibility. When it was settled, um, probably 
in the early part of the 19th century, they had a law that you had to have one ladder and two pails in each of your houses. So you were going to be invo involved in that too. Grand Rapids' first paid fire department was 1860. Kalamazoo's was 1877. And what we have here is the central fire station that sat on the corner of Lovell Street and the Kalamazoo Mall, where the Epic Center is located. Previous to that, Jacobson's was there. Um, in fact, I can't say Jacobson's is still there. It's just been changed um, a little bit with the Epic Center. Although I like to go into buildings like that and see if I can find evidence of Jacobson's. And you still can. So the Central Fire Station. Another thing we saw, too, in communities was the paid police department. Now, it's not that there wasn't any security in these areas, but so much of it was provided by the county sheriff. So over here, what we have is we have a picture of Benjamin Orcutt, who was the county sheriff. He was the only one who was killed in the line of duty. He was um, killed in 1867. So in a village like Kalamazoo, because we did not officially become a city until 1884, um, our public safety was provided by the county and the jail, the county sheriff and the county jail were located in the downtown area, so location-wise was fine. But uh, very soon, we began to get a professional fire department like this. I'm wondering how they got that dog to sit there like that. <laughs> Well-behaved dog. Um, so this is, the this is the police department probably around the 1890s. But Grand Rapids, their first paid police department was 1871. Uh, Detroit was 1873. So you can see what they're doing is they're trying to do what they can to improve the communities by providing you know, sanitation, water, some sort of sa you know, public safety, and also things like lighting and communication. What we have here is we have a picture of Bronson Park. And you can see some light uh, stands in there. Um, in a lot of communities in the late half of the 19th century, there was the transition from gas to electricity. Um, gas plants um, were mostly owned by private companies, but around the turn of the 20th century, there was a push to make them more publicly owned, uh, to make them in control of the voters, to try to, again, too, to regulate costs. Um, Kalamazoo kept going back and forth, and I think a lot of communities did the same thing. Um, their gas plant would be privately owned, then publicly owned, then privately owned. Another thing we have here is communication. You can see the lines on Main Street for the telegraph, which obviously predates the Civil War, but certainly improved. And then in the last half of the 19th century, you're also getting telephones coming in, too. Transportation. I love this photo. This is one of my, I, I just, I can't say favorite photos, because I have a lot of photographs that I really like. This is Main Street, Michigan Avenue. Here is Courthouse Square. That is the first courthouse on Courthouse Square. So that can date it for me right there, because the new courthouse was built around 1885, 1884. Here we have First Baptist Church. Uh, next to it, we have St. Luke's uh, Episcopal. That was there until about 1886. But I, what I want you to notice is I want you to notice the transportation we've got there. We've got you know horses, wagons, you know whatever. So this is pre, I'd say maybe 18, I don't want to put a, an exact date on it, but uh, you can see the transportation. You can see the dirt, the dirt streets. Notice the sidewalks and the fencing, another way of um, improving your community. But what a lot of communities adopted in the last half of the 19th century was some form of urban transportation. So in Kalamazoo, what we had, we had horse-drawn streetcars like this that began in 1885. They were then electrified in 1893. In any community, what would this kind of transportation bring? Well, the ability to live outside of the core downtown area. And so once you get the streetcars, you begin to see there were some people that were living uh, in the Stewart neighborhood and in the Vine neighborhood. But the streetcar gives you the ability later on to be able to go further in these neighborhoods and also maybe even up the hills of Kalamazoo. So when you look at, for example, West Nich Hill, because I live in the West Nich Hill neighborhood, when that streetcar was able to go up West Nich Hill and then it would turn around and come back, that's going to aid in the growth of these neighborhoods. Because now people can take the streetcar, and then they can take it back downtown if they work downtown, whether or not if they work in an office, if they work 
in for the public or if they work in a manufacturing plant. So, you know, city transportation is going to have an impact too in improving the city. This is also too like the utilities. You kept going back and forth between is it publicly owned or is it owned by a private company because we'll talk a little bit about things of trying to do things to regulate the costs of even riding the streetcar so that people can afford it. Quality of life in the last half of the 19th century was improving in a lot of different places. With the growth of the population, you have a growth of education, you have more schools, more school buildings, and you have public libraries. In a lot of communities in the state of Michigan, when you look at their public libraries, like the one we are in right now, they had their early beginnings as school libraries. Now, there, it's not that there weren't private libraries around these communities, there were. But as far as their public libraries, they would start as school libraries, and then at some point, there would be motivation to make them public. Because if it was a school library, you had to have at least some association with the school to be able to check books out. I think the most, I think one of the interesting, one of the many, many interesting stories about the Ladies Library Association is that when it started in the 1850s and they started growing their library into the 1850s and 1860s, there were a number of men who joined the Ladies Library Association. They were not allowed to have any official office in the association. They wanted to do it for one thing and one thing only, to have access to the books. They could check out the books. Um, anyway, so what we have here is we have two examples of public libraries. And many of these public libraries benefited from philanthropy. So the one on the right is the Grand Rapids Ryerson Library. That building is still there. If you've been down to Grand Rapids, it's incorporated into their new structure. Their new structure was built in the early 1970s, but they redid it a number of years ago. Absolutely gorgeous. My, my experience in genealogy started in this building with my brother when I was in seventh grade and he was in 11th grade. So I have very fond memories of this building here. The one next to it, Kalamazoo Public Library on the corner of South and Rose Street. Um, it it um, was the, so this one was as a benefit of, um, we'll talk about the Van Dusens, and this was the Ryerson. So in Kalamazoo, the public library opened up in 1872. Um, I'm not sure about the Grand Rapids Library. But the interesting story, because you do see also, too, in the last half of the 19th century, I talk about this rise of philanthropy. The stories of, for example, the Van Dusens. And um, I did some research on this couple, because I wanted to find out. They gave, was they gave $50,000 to build and furnish a public library. In addition to that, they had given $16,000 to purchase this piece of property. And Dr. Van Dusen had chosen this piece of property for the library. So I was interested to find out you know, where was the money. Dr. Van Dusen had recently retired from being the superintendent of the Michigan Asylum for the Insane, later known as the Kalamazoo State Hospital. Um, both came from the state of New York, and both came from um, families that had money. So they did have funding that they were able to um, give to something like this. They had been concerned because the Kalamazoo Public Library, previous to having their own building, had been in Corporation Hall on a couple of occasions. And Corporation Hall was the village hall. It also was the site of the village jail. And so they were concerned about children walking by the jail, and so they wanted to create a better environment. One of the things that I found interesting about the Van Dusens, and I found many things interesting about them, uh, when the building opened in 1893, there was very little fanfare. There was, you will not be able to find a dedication program for this building, because there was none. They didn't want that. But one of the things that they insisted on, which I think was so forward thinking of them at this time, they asked for the library to be open on Sundays. Now, I know that may seem, seem very unusual for 1893, but they had a specific reason. Because so many people worked six days a week. They worked Monday through Saturday. And they wanted to have them have an opportunity to be able to go to the library on their day off. So I thought that was very commendable of the Van Dusens. Some of the other things that we have going on um, is different institutions that improve the quality of life. For example, the YMCA and the YWCA. 
local chapters began at this time period. Um, with the YWCA, so many of them started statewide, nationwide, um, originally sometimes as Bible study groups. And eventually they sort of ventured out into um, studying other things and also working with women who were coming to the cities to work in the factories. And they would meet them at the railroad stations and make sure that they had a place to stay and make sure that they knew where they were going and what they were doing. And so they were providing services like that for them. The YMCA um, also had places where people could stay, men could stay, and also provided recreation for men. In both of these cases in Kalamazoo, the YWCA in Kalamazoo is one of the um, oldest Ys in the state. It started in 1885. And you'll see down here it says first YWCA 18, um, 1886, so not long after the organization started. Um, they originally had rooms in the building on the corner of East Michigan and Portage Street, where the old Peninsula Brew Pub is located, and there also is um, housing in that area. They were there for a short time and then moved to a house on Michigan Avenue that no longer exists. It later was the Truesdale Funeral Home and then eventually moved to their quarters on South Rose Street. The YMCA also started in the 1880s in Kalamazoo. Um, there was a period of time when they were inactive, but they did pick up again in the 1890s. And um, they built this building on the corner of Michigan Avenue and South Park Street. Uh, they stayed at that site. This building burned. They built another one on that site until the mid-1970s when they moved to the location on Maple Street. So that gives you some relation as far as that goes. Not just Kalamazoo, but all over Michigan, you have organizations like this that are helping people uh, in improving their quality of life during this time period when these cities are growing and there's services that are needed. The area of health care is changing in Kalamazoo and in other communities too. Before I get to health care, I would like to mention that one of the other things that we see at this time period in the last half of the 19th century in Michigan and in other states, and please I don't want you to think that's just Michigan that this happens, is music. A number of orchestras began. In fact, the Detroit Symphony began in 1872. You had bands and various musical groups. There were a plethora, I just like saying that word, plethora of groups in, Cal in Kalamazoo that provided music for people to not only participate in, but also to, entertain, uh, but to, to see as entertainment. The other thing, too, is you see the beginnings of different art associations and art organizations. Uh, the Detroit Art Association began, they had an exhibition in 1875. Their first, their first building was about 12 years later, about, yeah, about 13 years later. And that's the nucleus for the Detroit Institute of Arts. And there's a lot of other institutions that started about at that same time. We also had the beginnings of sports teams, too, either before the Civil War or after Civil War. So there's a lot of things going on in the community. So let's talk about health care. We see a beginnings, the beginning of hospitals in a lot of communities. I have two here, again, because my, my point of reference is Kalamazoo, but I think that it focuses and illustrates very well what was going on in other places. To the left, you have Borges Hospital, 1889. Uh, Monsignor Francis O'Brien, uh, who was pastor of St. Augustine had become aware, the story is there, that he had found a young man in jail, in the village jail, the city jail by that time, who really didn't have anywhere else to go, who was sick, had no family around. And uh, so he became aware of that. Uh, he was also very interested in creating some level of health care in Kalamazoo. And through the generosity of Bishop Borges, who was in uh, Detroit, they managed to get the money together to purchase this house on Portage Street and with the um, very able assistance and with the help and the support of the Sisters of St. Joseph who came here in 1889, um, they opened up Borges Hospital on Portage Street. Um, it was on Portage just about at the inner, between, well, to the north of Lovell, there's a street that no longer exists called Spring Street, and that's about where the intersection was. So you know, approximately like, you know, to the north, a little north of where the um, 
movie theater is located. That's where the board, where Borges Hospital was located. This is an early photograph of it. You can see the Italianate house. It had a very long setback from the sidewalk. You can see this very curvature, serpentine walk that led to the house. Um, eventually, when it was expanded, and it was expanded probably less than 20 years after it began, they built in front of the house. So they used that space well. Another hospital that was created in 1900 is Bronson. Although it wasn't known initially as Bronson, it was known as the Kalam as Kalamazoo Hospital. It actually traces, its, actually earlier in 1896, um, they began, but they formally um, organized in 1900 and then opened a few years after that. So you can see all of this, and I think especially too with the healthcare, trying to eliminate the impression of that one goes to a hospital to die. Um, so changing people's attitudes towards that too. So healthcare. All right. Well, let's look at other things that were going on in the last half of the 19th century. Politics. Um, Michigan is still dominated by the Republican Party, and it will continue to be dominated by the Republican Party until probably the 1930s. So um, it had been a Republican state going back to the birth of the Republican Party in the um, 1850s and continued like that for many years on. Um, their big supporters included farmers and businessmen, um, people who supported the union uh, that were supporting the Republican Party. We had two constitutions so far up to this point, one in 1835, one in 1850. Um, when you look at politics, there were attempts two attempts to rewrite the Constitution, uh, to come up with new constitutions, and failed. And so we continued to be governed under our second Constitution until turn of the 20th century. And we'll cover that tonight. As far as suffrage, keep in mind that when I talk about suffrage, I'm not just talking about women's suffrage, although women's suffrage is giving, getting a lot of publicity because of the passage of the 19th Amendment. And uh, the Michigan History Magazine that just came out focuses on women's suffrage. But first, I want to talk about suffrage for people who are African American. So the, first, the second Constitution of 1850 allowed the issue to be put to voters. Should African Americans have the right to vote within the state of Michigan? It was turned down seven to one. With the new proposed Constitution 15, 17 years later, um, the Constitution incorporated that. But the Constitution was put before the voters and it was defeated. What really turned the tide was not what, for suffrage for African Americans, the right to vote, was not so much what happened on the state level, but what happened on the federal level. Because right about this time period, you've got the 15th Amendment. And in 1869, two years after the voters turned down that proposed third constitution, the Michigan legislature ratified the 15th Amendment to the US Constitution, which gave African American males the right to vote not only in the state, not only in the nation, but also the state elections. As far as women goes, um, between after the Civil War, some women were given the right to vote, but only on school elections and only if they owned property. So there was this property ownership, which is ironical because in the early years of Michigan becoming a state, that was a requirement to vote, that you had to own property, period. If you were a man and you wanted to vote, you had to own property. But then that um, changed. Actually, it was before we became a state. Through the 19th century, there were organizations such as the Michigan State Suffrage Society that was created in 1870 that pushed very hard for women to get the right to vote. They even brought an amendment to the state constitution. Of course, who voted on it? The men, and it was defeated. Um, so they, you were dealing with this issue on women's suffrage for a number of years. And of course, for those of you that might be aware of one of the reasons why men voted against it, it was the issue of prohibition. Because uh, they were concerned that once women got the right to vote, they would continue to support prohibition. And that, for many other reasons, 
Throughout the 19th century, there were many efforts to give women the right to vote, but it did not succeed. Nope, there we go. So let's talk about now education. We did see in the 19th century uh, growth in education, higher education, of course also too um, with elementary and secondary education. Uh, to the left, you see a very nice painting of the University of Michigan. I don't know what that year is, but it's sort of to get us in the feel that we're in Ann Arbor. Uh, no stadium, no Saturday football games, nothing like that. So that's the University of Michigan. And to the right, this is a photograph of the Michigan Agricultural College that you know as Michigan State University. These schools continued to grow, as did the Michigan State Normal School, which was located in Ypsilanti. Um, which, of course, primary purpose was to train people to become teachers. And also, we had the Michigan School of Mines up at Houghton uh, to help prepare uh, engineers for the mining industry. There was pressure after the Civil War to allow women. Now, women were going to the Michigan, um, the Michigan Normal School, Michigan State Normal School, but what about the University of Michigan and Michigan State? Well, with the University of Michigan, it was this woman here, Lucinda Hinsdale Stone, who was the main instigator to allow women to enter the University of Michigan. And oh, for those of you that might know, not know Lucinda, let me add a little factor about her. She was from Kalamazoo. Anyway, um, Lucinda was involved with Kalamazoo College with her husband, J.A.B. Stone. And then um, she started then and then continued to put pressure on the Board of Trustees to allow women to enter um, the university in Ann Arbor. She succeeded in February of 1870 by allowing her former student. Now, I, I understand it's a little, it's not the clearest photograph, but we don't have too many photographs of Madeline Stockwell Turner. Um, Madeline was a student of Lucinda's. Uh, she had moved to Kalamazoo from Albion with her mother and stepfather. And uh, this was one, this was Lucinda's star pupil, and so she really wanted um, Madeline to be the first woman, and it was agreed to, and she went to school. Um, now, they were not the first state university, but they were by far the largest university in the country, the University of Michigan, at this time. Um, and uh, pretty soon, not only were women allowed to just go to um, the university, but they were allowed to enter medical school. And up here, I have a photograph of Helen Upjohn Kirkland, who was the oldest daughter of Uriah and Mariah Upjohn. And um, she had a very interesting career. I've, I've talked about her in various aspects and various programs. But um, when her brothers uh, were sent, her brothers and cousins were sent up to go to Ann Arbor to go to school, her sisters went initially to, well, she had a sister that went to school in Ypsilanti. Um, she basically managed the household. Um, she had gone to college, and she was a teacher. She entered medical school. So she was one of the, uh, not only did her brothers graduate from medical school, she uh, herself graduated from medical school and took up practice in Kalamazoo with her father, um, and uh, they remained for a while. I always find it interesting with Helen in a lot of different, there's a lot of different things that fascinate with me. One, one thing that fascinates me is how she kept her maiden name. She was always known as Helen Upjohn Kirkland. And I thought that was really interesting. But anyway, she graduated from the University of, Med Sco uh, the University of Michigan Medical School. Um, and she was one in one of the first classes in medicine. Um, Michigan State also followed in 1870. So both 1870, Michigan State and the University of Michigan allow women. Another thing we see as far as education goes is the rise of business colleges and business schools. Now, there had been these types of schools uh, before, but I think that things really began to pick up when there was the need for bookkeepers, telegraph operators, and other skills that you would need with all this manufacturing going around. And so there were a number of commercial colleges that were started. So we had such things as Parsons Business School, these two pictures are them. In fact, coincidentally, they are in the same building uh, that the YWCA had their first, off first um, offices, first rooms, that building where the uh, Old Peninsula Brew Pub is. 
Um, and these are two different pictures from two different years. Uh, but there were other colleges and schools, business schools, that were started at the, at the same time. Um, at the archives recently, we acquired a ledger from Bell's Commercial College in Battle Creek. And uh, that one existed probably until 1871-72. And uh, it's a workbook, absolutely fascinating to see the kinds of things that they were doing. So business colleges. And we also see the creation of new normal schools. With the rise of population, the rise of students going to school, you're going to need more teachers. And you're going to need to prepare more teachers. And so what we have to the left is a building from um, Central Michigan University. I think I have that right. And the lower right-hand corner is one of the buildings at Northern Michigan University up at Marquette. So those two schools, Central began in 1892, Northern began in 1891, oh, excuse me, 1899. And then, oh yeah, that's right, Western State Normal School began in 1903. And here we have East Hall in all its splendor um, with a central portion of the building in 1905. You have the gym to the right that was built in 1908. And the training school over to the left over here that was completed in 1912. And you're probably wondering, why do I have those dates so branded into my brain? is because until 2013, the archives at Western, the main part of the archives, was located in this part of East Hall. And I can tell you some very interesting stories. I can tell you don't hug the radiators because it will burn you after a while. Anyway, um, the other thing we have going on too in education, we've got at this time um, compulsory attendance laws. Uh, you know, they're dealing with children who are also working in factories. So can you get them out of the factories and, and going to school? So there's definitely a movement for that. We talked about Native Americans um, at both in session, in the first session. There were a couple um, evenings where we talked about Native Americans. And one thing I didn't really go into detail with and that really plays well here, and that is education, the area of education. When we look at Native Americans before, now what we have here is we have two things. We've got here, we've got a map that shows um, the various Indian lands um, that were ceded to the US government. And you can see here a list of the treaties that were signed. If you see this little yellow square here, you're probably wondering what that is. That's the reservation for the Saginaw Band of uh, Chippewa which is now where Soaring Eagle is located. So if you want to know where the casino is, you can just look at that square piece of land. That's their reservation property. But anyway, before the Civil War, um, there were missionary schools in the hands of the government uh, for children who were Native American. And uh, two years later, in 1857, there were 20 federally supported day schools in Michigan, which shows you the population we had here of Native Americans in Michigan. There were 48 total federal supported day schools, 20 of which were located in Michigan. I don't know what that means, the population or our interest in education. I'm not sure. Um, these students went home during the weekends. Um, and by 1860, we had 30 in Michigan. And the government supplied both the teachers and the supplies. After the Civil War, there was a change of attitude as far as education of uh, children who are Native Americans. Um, they went from day schools to boarding schools. And what you see here um, in this postcard is Harbor Springs, Michigan. Uh, you have the, um, the school to the right, which were run by the School Sisters of Notre Dame. And I know that well because when I was in elementary school, we were um, raising money for the sisters who were there um, as much as we could for supplies and other things that they needed. Um, not only was there one in Harbor Springs, there was a school in Mount Pleasant, and there was a school up in the Upper Peninsula at Baraga. Um, there were anywhere, at least in Mount Pleasant, there were anywhere from like 300 to 375 students. Um, the challenges with these schools is that there was an emphasis to have the children abandon their native languages, abandon their native practices. and. Um, they were um, continued probably until probably about, I think, uh, at least Mount Pleasant uh, closed about in the 1930s. If you go up to Harbor Springs, you'll see the church, but you will not see this, uh, these buildings over to the right on this picture. They're no longer 
uh, no longer there. So there were other things that were going on with the Native Americans at this time, too. Um, when they signed the treaties, they were recognized as federal, as separate governments um, by the end, of, by probably about 10 years after the Civil War, that recognition was no longer there. Um, but then um, things certainly changed uh, in the 20th century uh, with uh, the 1930s, and that federal recognition was put back with them. Okay. Another challenge is, when we look at challenges, what another category, another area we're looking at, uh, which we hadn't covered, is immigration and ethnic groups. Previously, we've talked about immigration in broad terms um, based on um, when we looked at the economy and looked at the numbers of people that were coming in here to work for the various industries. So for example, when we looked at lumbering, we looked at, for example, the French Canadians that came in. When we were looking at mining, um, we had the Cornish from England that came in initially. Then you had a number of people who immigrated from Eastern Europe to work in the mines. We never really looked in general on immigration at this time. Now, immigration is not something that happened in the, 19th century, in the late half, half in the 19th century. We had immigration to Michigan when the French were here, when the British were here, um, when the Americans took over Michigan in the 1790s. They found a very diverse population, not just French. The general reasons for why immigrants would come here basically fell within the three categories, economic opportunities. We've already covered that a little bit. We looked at lumbering. We looked at, we'll look at the auto industry and the numbers of ethnic groups that came to Detroit because of what was going on with the auto industry. Um, sometimes people would leave their country of origin during, because of depressions, when we think of the Irish with the potato famine, the rise of immigration of people from Ireland because of that. Uh, in the 20th century, we see the great migration of African Americans that came south up to the north because of the economy and the, the possibilities that were there for them. Political dislocation, that would be um, when you think of things going on politically like with in the 19th century, people, um, things that were going on in Germany um, with unification of the various city-states and people wanting to get away from that. Later on, I think probably the better illustrations in the 20th century after the war, when you look at the Lithuanians, the Latvians, uh, the people that are coming here. Religious upheaval, uh, probably the best example of that is in Michigan, is this situation. On the upper right-hand corner, you have Albertus Van Rolte, who was a minister in the Netherlands. And there were some members um, in the Netherlands, the Dutch, who did not like the state control over the Reformed Church. And so they decided to come, led by um, Van, Reverend Van, Van Rolte, came here in 1846. And they came here because they um, thought that by coming to the New World, by coming to the United States, that their religious and their educational aims would be achieved if they came to North America. Now, they originally were not going to go to Michigan. They were looking at other areas like Wisconsin and Iowa and Illinois. <coughs> but they came here, they came to Holland because, spe specifically West Michigan, because the Black River reminded them of the Netherlands. And they also felt that they could keep foreign influence to a minimum. Now, the state was really excited. And so the state of Michigan, back in the 1840s, paid for a pier at the mouth of the river and uh, sold 3,000 acres of land to build roads between Holland and Allegan and to Granville and Grand Rapids, because they really wanted to encourage settlement over on that side of the state. Uh, Kalamazoo, because when you look at the Dutch Triangle in Michigan, you're looking at Grand Rapids, Holland, and Kalamazoo. So in Kalamazoo, you had Paul Istem Bleicher, who was a capitalist, had a lot of money, came here and bought property, came here and bought uh, a large farm around in the Vine neighborhood and subdivided it and sold it to members who were also Dutch. And of course, they got involved in celery and other products. Um, in Grand Rapids in 1910, the total population that was foreign born was about 70, about 25%, 40% of which was Dutch. 
And that 40% also carried over to Kalamazoo in, in 1940. So a very large concentration of that. OK, you got to pardon me, but I had to throw him in. Let me introduce you to my great-great-grandfather. His name is Eberhard Cordes. And um, he was very typical of a number of immigrants that came to Michigan, excuse me, pre-Civil War. And uh, he and his family, actually it was his father and mother and um, all his siblings, left Germany. And they came to Westphalia in 1836. Westphalia is near Lansing. And uh, now they were Catholic. So they were, the Catholic priests came with them. And they settled in Westphalia. They were farmers. And uh, later on, a group of them left Westphalia and decided to go north of Grand Rapids to Alpine Township. And um, Holy Trinity Church there, they founded. And um, so you can see where Westphalia is on that map. So what was going on with my family was very typical of what was happening in Michigan in the 19th century. And that was a number of Germans that were coming over. And Michigan liked this so much that they decided to have a campaign to attract more Germans. We had several settlements. Like, for example, when you look at this very square map, you'll see a town that sounds very familiar to you. And when I mention Frankenmuth, I think you know, if you've been to Frankenmuth, what you can do at Frankenmuth. Now, no one has yet to explain to me what fried chicken has to do with German cooking. I don't know. But many people go to Frankenmuth because of that and also the German heritage that's there. But that was not the only German settlement in that area. There was also, you can see here, Frankentrost. And then Richville originally was known as, I think it was Frankenhilf. So there were a number of cities. Now, they came from Bavaria. So they all came from about the same region of Bavaria and landed in Michigan and settled in Michigan in the 1840s. So what was it about the Germans that Michigan decided that that was an ethnic group that they wanted to attract? Germans, well, when you look at this, you can see what Jacob Foss says in 1855. I like how he uses the word nice a lot. Nice is a nice word. I think sometimes nice doesn't get the credit that it really deserves. But um, he was writing this letter. So this, I guess you can also say, is another example of chain migration, when you're writing a letter and you want to encourage people to come. So why Germans? Well, they were considered to be ideal settlers. Um, when you mention, well, with my great-great-grandfather, um, you could also say that Van Rolte was the same way. Those groups were called covenant communities, where they came over in a group together, and they were bound by, in some cases, their minister, their priest. They all belonged to the same church. And so they would all settle for the most part. And they were considered to be ideal, because why? They believed in education. They were farmers. Um, they assimilated well. They really didn't hold on to their language. They would learn English. Uh, they went to church. For a lot of different reasons, um, they were considered to be I the ideal immigrant. And so Michigan, like many other states, did what they could to attract as many Germans as they could to come to Michigan. So what you see a list there is you see a list through the years of the different agencies and commissions that the state of Michigan created to attract Germans to come to Michigan. Now, in some cases, these offices were located in New York. Other times, they actually um, had offices in Hamburg because the ships were leaving Hamburg. The other thing that the state would do, and I can understand if you can't read it all that well, but they would come up with publications, some in English, some in um, German, to try to attract you to Michigan. So they would distribute these and talk. They would extol our virtues. They probably use a little better adjective than nice, because I don't know if people want to travel over an ocean if they're just going to see a nice road. I think that their adjectives are going to be a little more larger. You know, talking about 
you know, our resources and our fertile land. They're going to use fertile a lot because these people are predominantly farmers, as were my ancestors. They're going to talk about transportation. That's going to be, inter that's going to be important because if you're a farmer, you want to know how to get your crops to where they got to go. You want to get them to the market. So all these publications are going to do whatever they can to try to recruit them. And the state used money off and on to do that. And we can see that it started at, you know, throughout the 19th century. Um, did it succeed? Well, the, when you look at, I, I always like doing this in my classes. I would ask my class how many of them have German ancestry. And I'd have to say over half of the class raised their hands. Um, that it became German Americans are one of America's largest single ethnic groups, and it's definitely one of Michigan's largest ethnic groups. So it certainly had an impact there. All right, so immigration. You know I had to throw in my ancestors there. I could throw in more, but you know, it gets to the point where you don't want to hear my family history. But anyway, I'll leave that up to my brother. All right, so the last topic we're going to cover now is progressivism. Because of all this going on in communities, because of all this going on in cities, and yes, they are improving life, but there's still this feeling that we need to improve it even more. And so you have this, I don't know if you would call it a movement. It was really across the board. It just wasn't political. It was in a lot of different places. So yes, it was a reform movement. And um, they wanted to use government to improve life even more on the local level, the state level, the federal level. Um, even though they are trying to improve life, there's still a lot of unsafe conditions. There's a need for better services. What we're going to see is it was bipartisan. It wasn't Democrat or Republican. If you're thinking of progressivism, one of the biggest people you think of being a progressive is a Republican president by the name of Teddy Roosevelt. This was the era of Upton Sinclair. This was the era of Ida Tarbell, people that were muckrakers, that were doing whatever they could to bring attention to people about things that could improve even more in a lot of different places. Women played a huge role in the progressive movement um, through women's clubs. They would do what they could to do such things as Discussion, discuss the topics of, of what needed to be improved. Look at social justice issues. Um, there might be a way that they might be able to plan activities, create programs. There are women's clubs that at this time were doing things like funding playgrounds for children, pushing for nurses to be in schools, um, pushing bans on spitting in the streets, working on meat inspection. Um, we look at such groups, you'd see a number of mutual improvement societies. Or in Kalamazoo, we had the Women's Civic Improvement League. They would do such things as helping poor women open savings accounts, send nurses to homes, give them health care, advise women on legal issues like divorce, and hold workshops on a lot of different things. So the role of women during this time period is very, very important to see. OK, so what we're going to do is divide this up into a couple different categories. So let's look at government. There were some things that happened during this time period that were considered very progressive. And what you want to do in government is you want to make government more closely, that people are more involved in government. So you did such things as create direct primaries. And in Michigan, we developed a direct primary system for the governor, the lieutenant governor, and the state senate and for city officials. So those party bosses, those pictures of Boss Tweed in New York, that, who was very opulent and sitting around and making decisions as to who was going to run for what, we were going to let the people decide on those types of things. So you begin to see during this time period between 1890 and 1920, direct primaries. Also the creation of either making a law or having what you might consider an unjust law overturned, or maybe recalling somebody that you don't think has been doing a good job. The initiative, the referendum, and the recall began in a lot of states, especially in Michigan at this time period, where you can do things like, oh, 
let's put a deposit on bottles and cans. Or, hmm, warning doves. I don't think that that law that the state passed on being able to hunt morning doves is really very wise. Or, hmm, that state senator voted for a raise in the income taxes. We're going to recall them. Those are three examples of things that have happened in Michigan just recently, probably within the last 30, 40 years. So now things, they, things will be altered as far as how you can do this. And you'll notice that this evening I'm not going to go into any detail about how many signatures you have to have and how it has to become before the legislature. It's, it's as clear as it was when I was trying, as, as, let's just say as cloudy as it was when I tried to explain it five years ago has even gotten more cloudy as things have changed as far as what you can do. But the concept of that is still there. And the concept of that was started during this progressive period to give the voters a better handle. Now this was just not in Michigan. This was all over the place, too, and was considered, I'm sorry, you're going to hear me say this over and over, very progressive, very progressive. Direct election of US senators was actually something that was nationwide and was ratified by the 17th Amendment in 1913. So no longer was the US senator going to be appointed by the legislature. It was going to be uh, elected by the people. And as far as government reorganization at this time period, there were a number of cities in Michigan that adopted the city manager commission form of government. They did it in Grand Rapids. We did it in Kalamazoo around 1919. Another thing we did in Michigan is we created our third constitution. And there were some things in there that were considered very progressive, giving cities permission to make decisions for themselves. Do they want to own that electrical plant? Hmm. We're going to give them the right to be able to do something like that. Building roads, and we'll talk about that a little bit further, about building roads. Uh, giving women taxpayers, again, the right to vote, but only on expenditure of funds. So they can't vote for politicians quite yet. You see reforesting land, so this whole thing about conservation. Again, Teddy Roosevelt pushing conservation. Not just Teddy Roosevelt, but a lot of other people pushing conservation. That went into this Constitution. Labor laws. And also the line item veto. And regulatory commissions. So all of these were considered very progressive um, in 1908. Another area is regulation and taxation. Regulation. You know, you might have, you have all these different railroads that are so important for transporting your goods, transporting your, your wheat, your corn, whatever. But what you ran into is you ran into different railroads that would charge different things. There was no regulation, whatever. They could basically charge whatever they wanted to charge. And there was very little competition. If you're a small town in Michigan and you only have one railroad, you're going to have to rely on that railroad because you are not going to want to carry your stuff 200 miles away to market. So there was a big push to try to regulate um, with tax, not only the rates that railroads set, but also railroads being taxed and to gather that taxation to support things. Uh, there was a railroad commission that was established to set railroad rates. And in some of those cases, I mean, that money was not going to be spent on lavish gifts to people. They needed money for the primary school fund. You had to support the schools. So you were going to do it that way. There was also a push at this time by individuals to also regulate other industries. Oh, sorry about that. And so they want to look at, we've already talked about water, electricity, gas. They want to regulate them, mainly the fees that they're charging. But also looking at regulating and maybe taxing the liquor industry or the telephone companies. And again, trying to build up that money in the primary school fund so you could fund not only, so you could fund K through, K through 12 education, that type of thing. We did begin to see the graduated federal tax the federal income tax. Um, as far as the state goes, we don't have an income tax until many years later. But at least on the federal level, we have that. And it's a graduated federal income tax. And then labor, we see um, different safety measures happening. And so when you see in the labor area, um, factory inspections, workman's compensation, establishing 
a maximum amount of hours that someone can work, all very important at this time. Well, during the progressive era, what are some of the other issues that people are dealing with? Well, we talked about playgrounds, um, services to children who are physically challenged, visually challenged. Um, so services to children who are classified as disabled. Don't like to use that word too much. But children that need some type of aid in some way. And that's when, as I said, you also had nurses entering schools. Talked about conservation, the reforesting the land. So much of the land that had been decimated during the lumbering industry in Michigan is being reforested. And also transportation. Well, when you talk about transportation, you got to look at those guys to the right. Now, I'm not saying that everybody rode bikes like that. I just thought it was a pretty cool photograph. Very nice photograph. But when you look at transportation around the turn of the 20th century and definitely into the 20th century, there was what was called the Good Roads Movement. Now, if you look at the condition of most roads, this is what they were like. And you'd have this. Because keep in mind, we're sort of beginning to cover what we're going to be covering in May when we talk about the automobile industry. The automobiles are coming around the late 1890s into the turn of the 20th century. But one of the ways that you're really going to make people want to buy cars if you do something to the roads. The people who were really big on pushing for better roads were the bicyclists. The League of American Wheelmen, now even back in the mid-1890s when there was the bicycle craze, the bicyclists were pushing for bike paths along the roads. Oh my gosh, does that sound familiar? Wow. Um, the right to carry bikes and railroad cars. I think about that every time I see a Metro Transit bus in Kalamazoo with a bike rack in front of it. Equal rights with horse-drawn vehicles. Now, I have no idea what that meant. Nobody explains that when you read this. Equal rights with horse-drawn vehicles. But still, the irony of what they were doing around the last half of the 19th into the early 20th centuries compared to the issues that we deal with now about automobiles and people on bicycles sharing the road. I always like to say, sometimes things don't change. They just alter a little bit. Well, at this time, the person who was really involved in Michigan with this issue is this guy right here. This is Horatio Earl. He was a farm tool salesman. He owned a cycle company, and he was a member of the League of American Wheelmen. And he also became the chairman of the Michigan Highway Improvement Commission in 1899 in Michigan. Also served as a state senator. So he was involved with politics. And one of his big issues was improving the roads. So he was involved. Now, the Good Roads Movement, keep in mind, was not just Michigan. The Good Roads Movement was a national program to push for better, better roads. And so you can see here, this is his ad when he was running for state senate. Has a lot of interesting things in here. The Republican donut. Anyway, well, one of the things that he did in 1901 is he created the Good Roads train. And they traveled for about four weeks across the southern part of the Lower Peninsula. Uh, in 1902, they went for 14 weeks, and they had a series of cars that were pulled by, I don't know if it was pulled by a car or whatever, to try to get people interested in supporting funding for roads. And uh, so what happened in 1905, this was previous to the Constitution of 1908, in 1905 they passed an amendment that um, allowed for the construction of roads. And for many years, Michigan was not involved with any internal improvements. But in 1905, they could build roads. And then finally, three years later, they could fund the roads. Uh, they could put in more funding for roads. So you'll see now, now that was considered progressive. Because one of the things that the wheelmen, the bicyclists, were also concerned about were the farmers. How are the farmers going to get their products to market if the roads are like what we saw before? That was considered very progressive. <laughs> 
Other social issues? Well, prohibition. I always, I always found it interesting when you would talk to college students and you would tell them that prohibition was considered very progressive. And you explain to them what prohibition is. They had a very hard time grasping how the absence of alcohol could be considered progressive. Of course, you've got to keep it in context, that type of thing. But prohibition is something in Michigan that they, that the state and individuals struggled with for a long, long time. Going back to the 1840s when temperance, which is not prohibition, there is a difference between temperance and prohibition because temperance, you're just, you know, temperate. You're, you're, you're like maybe slowing down the consumption. Prohibition, you're ending it all together. As opposed to um, for that. So it's like what, so they had that. You'd have prohibition laws, but they weren't really um, effective in any way. And so finally, in the last half of the 19th century, they decided to do something about it. And initially in Michigan, you had um, local options. So a county, a community could decide themselves if they wanted to prohibit alcohol. And by 1911, 40 counties, so about half of the counties in Michigan, went dry. In 1916, there was statewide prohibition. So we had prohibition before national prohibition, because national prohibition, the state prohibition started in 1918. It was passed in 1916 but uh, effective 1918, which was two years before national prohibition. And that was considered very progressive. Well, why was it considered progressive? Because of the effects of what they felt alcohol had on the character of a person. Um, they may not be good to their family. They may be spending all the money. They may be abusive to their families. And also, too, they may not be good workers. The story of prohibition will continue as we keep this story of Michigan history going on throughout the 20th century because you know what happened when the nation became involved with prohibition. And Michigan was at the center of that industry, so we'll cover that a little bit later. As far as women's suffrage goes, um, I mentioned that there were a number of statewide organizations that were pushing for this. Um, they kept being told to wait and they did, but nothing really happened. Um, issues were defeated in the state legislature, but it finally went on the statewide ballot in 1918, and uh, by that time, by 1919, women were allowed to vote in state elections. Um, and then later on, Michigan legislature approved the 19th Amendment to the Constitution in 1920, so social issues. Well, I'd like to share with you two illustrations of two people that I consider very progressive to sort of share with you what, how they took a lot of these issues in their hands and worked with organizations and in various areas. Hazen Pingree, I love that first name. A former student of my husband's actually named his son Hazen, and he was surprised that I knew, knew who he was talking about. Hazen Pingree um, was born in Maine during the Civil War. Um, well, he fought in the Civil War. He was captured, was in Andersonville prison, and after the war decided to come to Detroit. Not quite sure what his motivation was because he was Nor'easterner. But got involved with the production of shoes, and uh, he did very, very well. Uh, by 1899, he was making a million dollars a year on the sale of shoes. Well, he decided to get into politics. He was elected mayor of Detroit. He remained mayor for seven years. But if you can understand, they had a 32-member council. Do you know how hard it would have been to get anything passed in a 32-member council in Detroit? Obviously, not very progressive. He attempted to break up monopolies, and that's the other thing that you saw during the progressive era. And one of the monopolies he wanted to break up were the streetcars. He was one that was very concerned about the amount of money people had to pay to ride the streetcars. And some of these people were not making that much money. They needed to get on the streetcar to get to their job. And uh, he tried very hard to reduce rates and equalize taxes. He wanted to work with the gas company to reduce their rates for people. 
Um, he wanted the city to own a lighting plant. He wanted, there was a major economic crisis during his tenure as mayor, and he wanted the city involved. He was very, very limited. So he decided to run for governor. I should add that in downtown Detroit, they do have a statue of Hazen Pingree, and that's where this comes from. Uh, I don't know when it was installed. So he ran for governor because he really thought that he could get a lot of these things passed on the state level. He was elected uh, in 1896 and just served two terms. And at that time, the terms were just two years each. And um, he wanted a lot of different things. He wanted the direct primary and the assessment of railroad land, home rule, graduated income tax, an eight-hour day. Unfortunately, he wasn't really able to achieve a lot of what he wanted because he wasn't getting cooperation uh, by the legislature. But he set the stage for a number of governors that followed him who did get those progressive issues through, like Chase Salmon Osborne, who's the only man from the Upper Peninsula that became um, a governor of the state of Michigan. Woodbridge Ferris, that name probably sounds very familiar because he had a little school up in Big Rapids. Uh, he was also during the progressive era. Um, Aaron Bliss, Fred Warner, all who were able to institute a lot of those things that Hazen Pingree wanted to. One more progressive person. And uh, when you're in Kalamazoo, you almost have to cover Carolyn. And we are very, very fortunate at the archives because we've got Carolyn Bartlett Crane's um, papers, uh, including a lot of photographs that you're going to see here. For those of you who have never met her, Carolyn Bartlett Crane, uh, born in 1858. She was born in Wisconsin. Wanted to be a Unitarian minister. Her parents really weren't all that keen on it. So she also became a teacher, newspaper writer, an editor, and one of my favorite things, she was a steamboat pilot. She did finally get agreement from her parents to become a minister. And uh, she came here in 1889 to be the minister of the First Unitarian Church. Uh, which was renamed People's Church. And what you see here, this building here, is the People's Church that was completed in 1894 on the corner of Lovell and South Park Street. And uh, she was one who believed in a um, utilitarian church. And so she started a lot of programs, many of which were adopted by other organizations, other schools, for example, in the church, they started the uh, first manual training classes for young men, and also what they called household science classes for young women. And both of these then were adopted by um, the Kalamazoo Public Schools. In fact, the Kalamazoo Public Schools were one of the first school systems that had these programs um, for students. She was also involved with um, providing meeting places for various churches and groups. Um, she later married Dr. Augustus Crane and um, became involved after that um, in the 1890s and the turn of the 20th century into more social justice issues and issues that related to civic improvement. And so she was involved with such things. We talked about meat inspection. Now, Carolyn was involved, and I use her first name. I shouldn't. I should call her Reverend Crane, but we call her Carolyn. Um, she was involved with the creation of the Women's Civic Improvement League. And their big thing was meat inspection. And they were able to pass a state law that pushed for meat inspection, the Meat Inspection Ordinance of 1903. Um, they were also involved with such simple things as cleaning the community up, like providing thing, places for you could throw your trash away and not throw it in the street. Signs, I really love this. Again, the Women's Civic Improvement League, what should you not do? And gentlemen, please do not spit on the sidewalk. Um, they also pushed on um, you know, cleaning Kalamazoo, cleaning the, the city. Um, and so we talk, they even emphasize things about what you shouldn't do as far as, as you want. We want to keep things neat and clean for a cleaner. Again, here we go again. Gentlemen, please do not spit on the floor or the stairs. So you see, they repeated it in a couple of occasions there, but they really pushed it. They published a lot of different things about, you can see little circulars about savings collections, talk about visiting nurses. The other thing that Carolyn was involved with 
was, uh, she also was involved with suffrage. In fact, in the collection, we have correspondence that she had with Susan B. Anthony, who was none too keen when Carolyn got married. Did not think that was a good thing for her to do. Um, she was involved with prison reform, uh, was involved with inspecting the poor farms around Kalamazoo, or not just Kalamazoo, but across the state of Michigan. And she also did a number of surveys of communities. You can see one here of Rochester, New York, and another one of the entire state of Minnesota, where she would go, she would make observations, she would talk to people, and then she would make recommendations of what a community could do, what a state could do to clean itself up. Uh, one of the things we have in her collection, which was really neat, I got to work on it, was all these badges that she would wear when she would do this inspection. Boy, it was pretty cool. You should have seen the badge she had in Minnesota. I mean, I guess you had to do that if you were going around and looking through nooks and crannies that you had to show that you were an official one. This star was very large, silver star. And uh, so she really w came equipped with a lot of different things. But if you see the causes that she was involved with, that the organizations that she was involved with were organized, it reflected a lot about how you wanted to improve life in these communities. And that was Carolyn Bartlett Crane. One more thing that she was involved with was the National Better Homes Program in the 1920s. And this was a national program. It was headed by Herbert Hoover, um, who was not president at the time. And what it was to do, is, to, and they did this yearly, it wasn't just in 1924, was to design a house that um, was considered to be very efficient for the family. And so she was involved with the design of what was called Every Man's House. It won the national competition. Um, it still is in existence on Westnage. Um, if you're coming up Westnage Hill past Maple Street, you'll pass a motel called the Westnage Arms or whatever. I don't know exactly, Westnage something or other. And it's the first house to your right. And she had things like the mother's room was near the kitchen so the baby could be there. Uh, she had a window over the kitchen sink so you could see outside. A lot of different features in the house that were considered very progressive. And the house is still there and it's still occupied. I'm not quite sure what the status of it is right now. I have heard rumors that it's Airbnb. I'm not quite sure if that's the case or not. But um, Carolyn Bartlett Crane. All right, so that is our ending for this evening. Um, where we will pick this up in May next month is we will now look at what is happening in Michigan and the beginnings of the automobile industry. So that will happen on May 9th, as I said, at 7 o'clock. Anybody have any questions or comments that you'd like to make at this point? Yes? That was around the 1920s. And they were doing that because it was being done in other, just universally in Michigan. So I think, I don't know specifically the reason, but it wasn't just happening in Kalamazoo. It was happening in other communities too. Any other questions? Yes? German farmers, how did they acquire the land? Was, it, was there was homesteading such a thing, or were they, given, were they mortgage tracts of land? How did they acquire the land? They purchased it. At least initially. The Homestead Act isn't until around 1860. And by that time, you have a number of Germans that have already arrived. Keep in mind that, like for example, when my family came here in the 1830s, land was fairly cheap. Because remember, you're buying the land from the federal government. You're not buying it from the state. You're buying it from the federal government. And land is about $2 an acre. Now, that did increase a little bit. But a lot of them were able to purchase it themselves. Now, we're not talking about big super farms. We're talking to like 40 to 80 acres, maybe 80 acres at the most, maybe a little bit larger, which is what my family had. So I think for the most part, you know, if, if they did not have the money themselves, they were probably able to get the money from some other source, some other place. Um, I'm, I'm sure that there were Germans that were involved with homesteading, but that happened a little bit later. Because yes, we did have Germans that were continuing to come in. Now, when you look at the Germans that were attracted to Michigan after the Civil War, I don't know what the statistics are as far as how many of them were farmers and how many of them went into um, manufacturing jobs or commercial jobs. In my family, some of them stayed on the farm. Some of them moved to Grand Rapids and got involved with things like that. Any other questions? Yes, Anne. 
I haven't heard of too many people complaining. I'm not sure what the tax rate would have been because it would have relied on property taxes. And because there would, as I said, there were um, in Michigan, at least in the state of Michigan, the income tax didn't come about until the 60s. So mostly they're relying on property taxes for that. But you have to think that if in some way it's going to improve your water or your sewer or something else like that, that you might be willing to do that. Um, with the library, and I might say, if you want to get another view of the Van Dusens, if you just exit this room, you'll see paintings of, of Dr. and Mrs. Van Dusen. Um, they actually helped, of course, with the construction of the building, but the support of the library would have been through um, probably your school taxes or your public taxes. Your, of course, it originally was the school taxes and then later on with the public taxes around in there. But I have not heard of anybody complaining about anything like that. I think maybe in some cases they were probably grateful that they didn't have to worry about the well water that was behind where they were and that they had a more stable source of, of water for something like that. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> Anyway, any other questions? All right, well, I want to thank you for joining me this evening. I do appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.